The year is 1963. Iran is undergoing land reforms along with the mass mechanization of agriculture. Suddenly, there's mass unemployment in rural areas, and large movements of people from villages are going to the city, especially Tehran, in search of jobs. Between 1963 and the latter part of the 1970s, Iran enjoyed a huge economic boom. This improved living conditions, sanitation, and health services, which all contributed to a big drop in the infant mortality rate and a spurt in population growth that continued until the 1990s. In the mid-1970s, half the population were under 16 and two-thirds were under 30. This was to be the generation of the revolution. However, this economic boom was short-lived and inflation rose sharply. Tehran in the 1970s was a strange place. Large numbers of very wealthy people many wealthy to a degree most Europeans could only dream of, lived side by side with some of the poorest people in the country. The city was already a city of concrete, with only a core of a few older palaces and government buildings. But despite the traffic and the ugliness, the older Iran was still there in the chardors on the street and the call for prayer at dusk. The West, especially the United States, were constant presences. From the Coca-Cola and Pepsi on sale everywhere to American cars and American advertising. But constant also were attention and a distaste for that American presence. The young men of South Tehran newly arrived from traditional communities in the countryside and either having no jobs or only poorly paying ones, saw pretty young middle-class women sashaying up and down the streets, flush with money, unaccompanied or with girlfriends, dressed in revealing Western fashion, flaunting their freedom, money, beauty, and from a certain point of view, immorality. Status, and the lack of it, is not just about money, it is also about sex and desire. Tehran was a place of aspiration, but in the late 1970s, it became for many a place of resentment, frustrated desire, and disappointed aspirations. This rebellion against the tradition of modern enlightenment, towards authenticity, mounted in the name of an equally modern championing and politicization of the fundamental truth in cultural tradition, or of the demand for an overarching socio-cultural meaning for society. Figures which spoke to such ideas were greatly inspired by a single philosopher. For Heidegger, modern thought is in some respects a regression from the truly great thinking of earlier ages, where the Greeks, especially the pre-Socratics, were willing to tackle the biggest questions of human life modern people were largely unconcerned with such seemingly abstract and uncommercial questions. As modernity continued on its course, questions about existence and its meanings were increasingly dismissed in favour of technical questions such as how can I understand the empirical world accurately so it can be manipulated in my interests. Modern people were unconcerned with why there is something 
instead of nothing at all. Which for Heidegger was the key question of metaphysics and indeed for the human life of das Sein. That being for who being is a question. Instead, they wanted to generate ever more powerful systems of knowledge such as the technical sciences so the world could be more easily broken down and instrumentalized. This, Heidegger thought, generated highly inauthentic individuals who were unable to live meaningful lives. This is because the primary purpose of existence was regarded as the pursuit of a kind of materialist satisfaction. This was true across political forms, which is partly why Heidegger claimed that the hyper-partisan distinction between left and right is actually trivial. Both liberal capitalism and its great rival socialism are equally devoted to the modernist pursuit of materialist satisfaction. The only difference between them is over the most efficient means to pursue that goal. Heidegger's obsession with the return was very much resonant to Iranian intellectuals of the time. This return was inevitably also an obsession with the creation of corresponding social institutions. In the context of his work Being and Time, it centers the concept of a radical return to the pure origins through the combination of the philosophical language it invents and the authentic action ultimately collective in nature, that it aims to unleash. Heidegger's critique of modern society as inauthentic amounts to a critique of empty cosmopolitanism. He called this condition nihilism. On a philosophical level, it amounted to this. To forget being and to cultivate only beings, that is nihilism is within the broad discursive context of this alternative vision of modernity that Heidegger's thought as well as his influence on significant Iranian intellectuals and social movements can be understood. Heidegger too, under the influence of such discourses, deplored democracy as the system of a more general historical decline and dreamed of restoring a higher and deeper cultural meaning to both politics and society. In the Iranian context, what almost all supporters of the Heideggerian project share is this deep hostility towards what is an essentialized notion of the West. This, this idea of the West represents less a geographical space and rather tries to explain a cultural construction, secular, universal, and morally unstable. It stands as the determined foe of the truth in tradition and of being and belonging, both of which is routinely undermined to render man a homeless and hopeless creature lost in the world. Heidegger's project also offered a philosophical refuge for those who want to construct such nativist ideologies and confront Western modernity as a universal project that has no tolerance for local culture or moral ideas. In this discourse, the West becomes the antithesis of any national aspiration. Many forms of extreme nationalism, from racial to ethnic and religious variations, find Heidegger's work quite attractive. In the Iranian context, the discourse of West toxification, articulated by Ala Ahmed, comes directly from Faridid's interpretation of Heidegger and achieved massive influence both at the time of its publication 
and in the decades that followed. This discourse must be understood against the background of successive experiences of disillusionment with Western and universal philosophies of liberation for both the particular author in question and the general society that received his work. It re-articulated the dilemma of Iranian intellectuals, which had previously been understood in terms of universal struggle for human emancipation through liberal, nationalist and Marxist discourses, in terms of an essential choice between cultural authenticity or return to self, and subservience to the West or rootlessness.